Sure, sure. Right, so we were, we were coming, let's just keep, keep our trajectory here. We're coming from this notion of tzedakah, chesed, right? And then we were trying to say at the end that chesed you can even give to the rich, right? So we wanted to understand what was rich first. So that's what we started, about, started, started, started talking about Shlomo Melech. This is the tachlis of wealth. Wealth beruchnius, wealth begashmius. And what was his ultimate wealth was he accessed this level of keser, the panemius of keser, atik, right? Which is a level which is more than what's shayach to the world, right? Because if the, if the ari is the fifth part suf, and that's already maki, but it's still shayach to the world, yeah, tell, stop me if I'm speaking Chinese, then uh, the part suf above that, which is atik, it's already completely beyond shayach to the world, that makes the world rich. It makes the world rich. It's not Hanukkah yet. And, and so we're, but we're saying that chesed, you can even, is shayach to even give something to the rich. How do you give something to the rich? You don't just make them slightly richer, because that means they weren't fully rich in the first place. You have to give them a type of wealth, which is be'en aruch, something which is in, completely incomparable to where they were before. Like we said, like the, you know, the whole, all the money in the world kind of thing. So we said, okay. So that being said, um, there's also... This that Shlomo was, was rich or gave wealth to the world, it also affected the way he did birurim in the world, how he refined the world. Because he was at a state of atik, basically, he was called Shlomo because the world was in a state of manucha, shalom v'sheket hayab yamav. There was, there was peace in his days. What does it mean, peace? So we said, as opposed to Moshe Rabbeinu and the Mishkan, where there was somehow a lack of peace. Why? Because we said there was two people that said, Kuma Hashem, rise up Hashem. Moshe and David. <clears throat> Moshe said, Kuma Hashem, misanecha. He said, rise up Hashem and scatter your enemies. Did we do this together? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and what does it mean, scatter your enemies? It means there's still an enemy there to be scattered. Whereas David said, Kuma Hashem Limnucha Secha. Rise up to your peace. And the notion here is that the bitl. I, I forget exactly where we got up to because I. Yeah, me too. No, I'm afraid to like just start teaching the <laughs> next sure, class like b- Baal Peh. Yes. Yeah, but we went into Ches also, right? Yeah. I don't remember though. Shoot. We, went, we, went, uh, yeah, we, we, we talked we, about we, the Aron going in the desert? No. Yeah, we did. That that was uh, they, it was like fighting all the right. We did speak about that, right? I don't think we got to Hinei Shlomo Haya Ish Menuchah. We didn't. No, we must have. I don't think yeah, so, we, but we maybe we did. No, we must have. We no, must have. We did. We go up to. Yeah, that's the end of the test, though. We must have gotten there. Anyway, I think we were right in the middle of there somehow. All right, let's just we'll do it. You know, we'll do it inside. It doesn't hurt us. Um, he was a man. Okay, so we're sitting like this. Shlomo was a man of peace because there was no war in his days and also the way he, that he was able to refine the sparks was in a way of peace. What does it mean to refine the sparks in a way of peace? Anybody? He would stay in the palace. And he stayed in the palace and the sparks came to him. Like right? The, like the river. Exactly. Like Mashiach, everyone flowed to him. Right. right? Due to the fact that there was a base of Mikdash, due to the fact that there was such godliness, the godliness drew, drew the sparks to the godliness. Okay? Um, it's like the easiest way we've ever heard about that. Yeah, so he says, yeah, for sure. So he says, okay, Tuvet said, Kuma, we definitely did this. Sorry about this, guys, I've kind of lost our spot. I don't know, you know yeah, so he said, when it, came to the, when it came to Moshe, however, in the Midbar, right, he had to go and take the Aaron out into the desert, right, because that's a way of Milchama. Kuma Hashem Vayafutsu Evecha. Rise up Hashem and scatter your enemies means he had to go in, into the place of the enemy to nullify the clippers that were in the desert, the snakes and the scorpions, etc. And he had to go mevara um, the netutzos, refine the sparks that fell there, and that's called refinement by way of milchama, right? So there's two ways, uh, and we started talking about davening, that in, when you daven you have to go, sort of climb into your nefesh Bahamas and fight with it in order to yank the sparks out. Versus, we're going to see Torah is a way of just sort of staying in your sta- space of Kedusha and you can elevate the sparks from there. We're going to see about that soon. And he says, but what was Moshe compared to? Like a king that goes out 
to the uh, I think this, let's take it from here exactly right the line is three lines up from the bottom of the page nun the bottom of uh, paragraph ches three lines up from the bottom kamo melech sheyotzim makomo like a king that goes out of his place v'holech l'medina ha'oyev and he goes to the place of the enemy li'lachem bo l'choshvo in order to fight with him and to conquer him there. V'lechein Amar Moshe, therefore Moshe said, B'nogel in Asiyos HaAron Bamid, but regarding the traveling of the Aron in the desert, he said, V'ayhi bin so Aron kuma Hashem. Right? He says, when, the, when bin so Aron, when the Aron is busy traveling, because a king who has to go out to warfare has to travel, unlike Shlomo, then he said, Kum Hashem v'yafutso evecha, rise up Hashem and scatter your enemies. In other words, it was a, it was, he was on the go. He couldn't refine the sparks by staying stationary. He had enemies that he had to fight against, the snakes and the scorpions, i.e. the sort of tamtsis, the concentrated clippers that the midbar represented, that the Yidin had to, had to go and refine on a clotless level so the world could proceed with its mission. What does Tishnam mean? Which one? De Yeshnam. That there are. I will get you some day, Tishnam. By Biro, Al Yide Giloi, Shehei Rebbe Beis HaMikdash. However, the refinement process of the world that took place through the Beis HaMikdash, Haya Baderech Manucha. That was in a peaceful path. The Shlomo Haya Bimkomo. And the sparks, as we said, were drawn to him all by themselves. Therefore, David said, "Rise up, Hashem, to your rest." And it was David was building, the, was, knew that the base of Mikdash was going to be built. He designed it, so he was already realizing that there was going to be a level of elukus that had the effect of bringing the sparks to him. Do you know what the snakes and scorpions represented? Like I would say it's the Chashim, Srafim, Vakravim is like the three Gimel Klippas at Right? Which one of those things? The three impure levels of Klippa. There's Klippas Noga and then there's the three. Uh, okay. So they were sort of like the That's living coming, embodiment. Uh, they were coming of, out of Mitzrayim, so they would have, uh, you know, Israel would have had all sorts of uh, trans, it's like a transition, isn't it? Yeah. It was the, it was the, yeah just in general, we talked about well. how the flood was required in order to refine the world, you know, it was like a mikvah, yeah. right? And then, and then you had Avram had to have his bris, and, and there were certain things that the world had to go through stages right. in order to be, you know, sort of shayach to getting the Torah, and then shayach to going into Eretz Yisrael. There were sort of big, the whole Torah talks about big klalim of epochs and eras that we see that the world went through in order to remove certain certain blockages that, that made it, of Oros Hashem wasn't even relevant yet, right? What, what's with these couple thousand years before, before the Torah was even given? What was going on in the world right then, right? So there was a whole stage of just like undoing, you know, it's almost like a kid before he has a bar mitzvah, right? He doesn't even have a nefesh alokis. He doesn't even have a shaykhah to doing of Oros Hashem. So this Indian of the, of the Jewish people going around in the midbar, there was still like a very, very strong level of klippa, which represents this midbar, which we couldn't, it wasn't really shy to go into Eretz Yisrael and begin the true avod until that was taken care of. So there's another stage. Um, yeah, so he says, he stayed in his place. Okay, I think this is, I don't think we did this yesterday. So he says that we have an issue here. Because every place, it's explained that the biru, or every place in the Hasidus, and if you look elsewhere in other drushes, which talk about this concept of Moshe going around the desert with his magic ark, nullifying the klippas, it explains that the biru, haya agadi nesiyas ha'aron, bamidbar, that this refinement that took place by the traveling of the Aaron in the desert, who biru bederek manucha. It says something opposite of what we're saying now. It calls that a refinement by way of manucha, of peace, not war with the way we're describing it. So that gives us better insight into this Well, that makes sense, though. Why? There's so much holiness, it just burns everything in the way. Right. But they didn't really have to fight with the, with the snakes and scorpions. They just right. kind of arrived, right? They went away. Went and, away. and it was automatic. Yeah. But here we're saying that the fact that he had to travel into the land of the enemy was warlike. Yeah. So what's going on? He <laughs> inyan manucha shem as you said exactly, the idea of peace that's described there in those Maimari, is that the, <coughs> it's exactly what you said, that the refinement took place automatically. 
because the refinement of the clippers, um, the nullification, excuse me, of the clippers, and the refinement of the sparks, shenaflu behem, that fell there in that place, al yidei agiloi, sheheir b'mishkan, that took place through the revelation of God that was in the Mishkan, Haya B'derek Mamela. It was it wasn't automatic. And it was as soon as they arrived, the whole place flourished like a garden. And the snakes and scorpions just disappeared and the mountains you know evened themselves out and so forth and so on. Lechain Gama Birusha Aidea Aron Bamishkan, therefore even that refinement through the Aron in the Mishkan, Nikra Biru Baderak Manucha. It is called on a relative scale a refinement by way of peace still. Right, but as you said, Avram, uh, Amisi's in Yin Hamanucha. If we want to really understand Shlomo, we understand the true concept of peace. Shemivarer eino yored lemakum hamisbarer ela nimtza bim komo. That the refiner does not descend into the place of the refinee, but rather he stays in his own place. That's ultimate peace. In other words, Moshe, he didn't have to fight with any clippers. But at least he had to go into the domain of the Klippas, at very least. Right? Whereas Shlomo, he didn't even leave his own realm of holiness, so that's the ultimate level of peace. It wasn't only automatically that the Klippas got refined, like it was in Moshe, but on the contrary, the Klippas came to him. or Through the revelation of light, of the refiner, that he shone out, to the refined, the the the, the spurs that had to be refined, who nimshach ba'atzmo la mevarer. So just by him shining this light, Shlomo, it automatically drew and drew the refine the refinee, the things that need to be to be refined towards him. Right, so this is much a high level. You, it, it's it's just something a person can contrive in and of themselves. If you get to such a light, such a level in your in your own avodas Hashem that you're shining so much light, it literally draws your avoda to you. Anything that you have to refine, or anything that you have to take care of in the world, it comes to you. And okay, obviously we're talking about the tzaddikim of the highest order here, but on some level, we're learning this because everything has to be shaykh to us in some way, right? So sometimes you have to, you know, it's harder to, to see your course in life. Like what, what, is, what is your, you know, it's, the, it's basically the big question of everybody's life. Like what am I doing with myself, you know? What do I? What am I here for? So you know, the more you and, and, and so people say, you know, my my line is, you know, come to yeshiva. So you say, well, Rabbi, that's the opposite. You know, then I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm just sitting in a room for hours and hours on, on end. So the idea behind it is, if you go deeply, deeply, deeply into yourself and start to become a holy, so you draw your your function of your life, your purpose of your life. It becomes clear to you. It it can come to you much faster than if you start chasing around looking for it. You could be like on a wild goose chase for the rest of your life. Because who's to say that you're gonna pick up the the sparks that you need? You're gonna be. I mean, everything's by hashkacha practice, certainly. And it, but so is running around the desert look, looking for snakes. You know, I mean, you could you can you can do a lot of the legwork by just refining yourself. There you go. I couldn't have said it any better myself. This is the Indian of Hasidus, right? It's called the the long short way, right? That's what that's what that's what yeshiva is. It's very long. You're just, you're just steiging away. You don't you don't see daylight of what you're going to do for a living, who you're going to marry, etc., etc. But if you do it right, if you do it, you spend the time properly. It's the short way, Mama. She, you bring your birurim right to the, your doorstep. Anyway, menucha ba'ofen ze. <coughs> so, this type of level of peace, tranquility, was in the days of Shlomo Davka. Now, we talked about tefillah, and I, I, I warned you, Torah was coming. So, this is like a biru that happens by learning Torah. The Bechlalus, that in general, Gama biru shalgadei galia de Torah, hu bederech menucha. The Torah in general, even... Even the revealed parts of Torah, right? Not Kabbalah, not Hasidism. It also works in a way of total manucha. In other words, it's a birur by way of staying in your place and drawing all the sparks to you. As opposed to davening, which is like Moshe going mano imano with the snakes. The kevan shah birur hu bederach mamela. And he says that the refinement takes place automatically when you learn Torah. And how does that work? It's very pushit. In other words, it's, it sounds a little bit... 
esoteric at first, but it's it's a very simple fact. Al yidei shalom dim b'torah shadaver zeh muter v'daver zeh aser. Don't think about it so much. But there's one way of coming in contact with, you know, biruring, which is that you're sitting in front of mamish plate of milk, you know, a plate of meat and a glass of milk, and you have to like mamish. You're, you're about to eat it, and you're going to refine one or the other, you know. And that's like a derech milcham. That's why you know it says in Babel they used to put on their gartel before they ate. We put our gartel before we pray. The time of prayer is the time of war, but really the time of prayer, time of eating, yeah. is the time of war. Because you're going mano imano with your nefesh Bahamas, you're be, the world, right? You're going to consume it, or you're not going to consume it. You're literally going to eat the sparks or leave them aside. But the idea is that when you learn Torah about those very same milk and meat, you don't even have to deal with it. You just you say, it's mutter. It's aser. Right? And what are you, you're talking about the same plate of meat and the same glass of milk that, that Plony has to go eat and deal with it on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a direct level. You can already take that piece of the world and just refine it by poskening on it, whether or not it's it's part of Torah or it has to be rejected. So that's a called a that's what happens when you learn even nigla, right? When you learn the revealed parts of Torah, you refine something automatically because you just you just put it in its proper place in the context of kedusha by discussing it al pi Torah. Hemis barim and they automatically get refined. Literally, there's a difference, right? This is kind of a crazy thing, but there's a difference between that plate of milk, meat and that glass of milk having discussed it and poskined on it than there was a moment before. You've literally changed the dynamics physically, chemically of the whole thing because it's now been refined. It's, it's, right. being, it's being enlivened by a different level of, of, of elukus, right? Because it's, it's clear what it is. It's part of the Torah. It's not part. It's not it's rejected from the Torah. So this is called refined all by itself without having to deal with it. Did you say when you pass something, you uh, change the, the 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 actual thing physically? Mamish, there's a cow in, in the in the uh, in in the body over here. You know that there is, right? I don't want to scare you, but there's cows out there, man. <laughs> right now, the fact that all of a sudden we're talking about there's cows out there, and we're going to put it in the context of a, of a Hasidic class, literally changes the whole nature of the cow out there. Mm-hmm. Because because they're now that cow is not just pushed part of the bria being like a state in a state of pirud from elokus. Especially if I can identify the exact cow and I can put him into a particular halacha and so forth. And someone's going to actually go and take that cow and make tefillin out of him because of this psak din. But even before that happens, right? Yeah, he's now entered into a sort of context of Torah which he wasn't in before. So that we've refined that aspect of the world. Wonder, how is learning Torah a beer though? Because everything you learn is, is Kadosh. It, it, That's the whole point. It, w- when you're learning Torah, that that Ma'amadu Matzah of learning Torah is Kadosh. No question right. about it. But what you're talking about when you're learning Torah is the world, which is not L'chad Chila Kadosh. Okay. So when you, when you begin to talk about the world and take it into the context of the Kadosh, that's called refining. Just like the piece of cheese was not kadosh particularly. When a Jew comes along, makes a bracha and eats it, he makes it kadosh. It's called refining. In other words, our whole business is taking the world and bringing it into the context of Yiddishkeit. Right? So when you learn Torah, especially Nigla, right? right which Nigla is only talking about trumas and Maisa and, 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 and Gzela and etc. etc. It's Tzedakah. You are t- talking about worldly things and automatically you're bringing them into a... without having to give Tzedakah. You're automatically... Look at the Tanya we've been learning for the last few days. He's talking about how just speaking about the laws right. of the mitzvahs is the same quality of doing the mitzvah. Right. Because you're, you're, it's, it's halacha lamaisa and it's alpi dibor, which is already a physical inyan. And you can schlep it in to basically have, be, as though you're doing the mitzvah and accessing the mitzvah just by speaking about it. Right? So this is a bureau of Derek Mamela. You don't have to leave your chair. It's perfect. <laughs> right? Stay, stay tight. Okay. So this is, uh, this is, this is the Indian of Torah. Even, even Gali, right now we're only talking about revealed parts of Torah. Imagine what Hasidus bureau is. Avava Pratius. I think that's where we are, right? No? Uh, oh, velo kabir de tefila. Right. This is not like the, the refinement of davening. Mm-hmm. Which we spoke about before. Davening is not memela. Davening is shas tloisa shas krava. The time of davening is the time of war. 
And krava, which means war, it also means close. You have to come into close proximity with the thing you're dealing with. You can't sit in your place and have your nefesh Bahamas be mivared. Um, it's made up that word. Uh, <laughs> automatically, you have to come b'shas krava. You have to go close to it. You have to go deal with it, wrestle with it. And that's called mislavish the nefesh elukis into the nefesh Bahamas. You have to actually go climbing into the evil place like Moshe to climb into the midbar. Right? So this is not b'derech mamela. So not, not to the tachlis degree. L'chein gam habiru sha'agdei gal yid Torah and therefore even the refinement that takes place to the revealed parts of Torah nikra biru derech manucha. It's called a refinement in a peaceful way. You don't have to fight. Aval v'pratius but in a more specific area line since when you're going to learn nigla and refine the world as we just described the cow in the in the forest, who are they? he he gashmi. Right? You're still talking about physicality, right? In in my Torah learning, I'm still in some way going into the place of the enemy, because I'm not talking about just elokus kipshuto as it is without turning into a world. I'm still talking about elokus as it's manifested as some foreign entity called the physical world. Hey, yeah. It says mislabash though, which means that it's a distinct entity from the thing that it's dressing itself into. Okay. So it's like coming down, but it's not that thing. It's like, uh, like Yaakov were in the clothes of Esau. Mm, but that's, that's the Indian of, of, uh, of war. It says the same thing regarding the Nefesh Elokis, if you look two lines up, going into the mislabash and the Nefesh of Bahamas, which is the definition of coming close and fighting, right? So, <coughs> the idea here is that since I'm talking about the cow in the forest, the plate of meat, the glass of milk, which are things of this world, <coughs> even though I'm not actually touching them, I'm still going into their country, right? I'm going into their domain. <coughs> and ref- so it's, it's, it is, it's like the ark, basically. This is, this is kind of exactly like the ark. It's Baderach Mameila, but not the Tachlis of Baderach Manucha, which means it happens automatically without touching it, but not totally without way of war, not totally in peace. Because I'm still going into the territory of the enemy, which is the physical world. I'm still dealing with things that need to be, be refined and things that need to be, so to speak, you know, conquered, which is the Gashmi Yisdika world. So that's Torah of Nigla. There's still a war going on there. And that's why, you know, when you go into a base medrash, it sounds like if it's a healthy base medrash, it's like warfare. You know, spears screaming at each other. Right? They're, cause, because even the dere, that doesn't happen when you learn Hasidist usually, at all, right? Because you're not, you're not fighting with each other in the Torahs of Hasidist. It's not written in such a way where you have to like try and, you know, stake your claim and, and, and hold your ground and, and prove your point. It's just not, it's not really, I mean a little bit, but not, cle- not nearly at the same level where it's push it a battle. Because even the ofen of the biru, I'm sort of adding this in, but I've seen this in other places, even, maybe he says it even, even the ofen of the biru is that you learn the Torah in a way of Talmud Bavli, which everything is not clearly stated for you there. It's, it's something that you have to, you have to get confused in order to, in order to get clear. It, it demands confusion. In other words, it's not just us, right? Anybody who learns Talmud Bavli, wind, you wind up in yourself in a situation where you're, you're confused, and that's, it's written like that in order to take yourself out of that confusion and refine the spark of your intellect, right? Just like the godliness goes into a cow and the source gets confused, like what am I doing in a world until a Jew comes over and refines it and brings it back into the holy family. So nigla is, is a way of war. It's a way of capturing booty, as it were. And this is just like the king going out of his place and going into the land of the enemy. Like we said, Moshe going into the Midbar. And again, even though Moshe went into the Midbar, he didn't really fight, you know, hand and fist with the scorpions. But he still had to go into their place. This Nigla. Therefore, we finally arrive. What's the true level of refinement? This is the Birur al Torah. This is by learning Chassidis. This is why we're stressing this so much. Remember, this is the source material to go into the ultimate uh, what we're trying to get for in Yonah Shal Torah It's just this beautiful sikha with the, where the Rebbe says, this is what Hasidus is. And I said, you can't understand it until you learn this mimer. This mimer was said right before it in that Febrengen, if you recall. So now he's trying to explain to us exactly what 
What, is, what are we doing when we learn Hasidus? Like, what's so great about it? Everybody, you know, Torah, Torah in general is great. Why are we, why are we uh, getting so excited? It's a combination of the two. What do you mean? It's prayer and sort of pure Torah or something. I'm not necessarily arguing with that statement, but where do you see prayer in the, uh, in the equation? It's still a fight. Panimia Satura? Yeah. He's trying to say that it's not. He's trying to say that Panimia Satura is like the Shlomo Amelech uh, scenario. Let me, let, me, let me put the pieces together. Fighting with the enemy, Mamish, is called prayer. That's not even the level of Moshe, right? <laughs> prayer is davening or eating. When I mean, you actually have to like, come into contact with the actual world, heaven forbid, right? And then there's Moshe Rabbeinu, who's one level up. He represents Torah, but nigla of Torah, where you don't actually deal with the world. You sit in your room, right? But you're talking about the world. So that's called going into the land of the enemy, at least, but not actually fighting with him. And that's represented by Moshe traveling around the desert in the land of the enemy, but not having to actually deal with them, just bringing the ark there. And then there's Panimius Atur, which is Shlomo Amelech. So you just stay in Yerushalayim and all the sparks come to you. You literally don't fight with anybody. It's like pure Torah where because... why and we didn't really, he, The Rebbe didn't like really finish the sentence per se, but why is it like that? Because in Panimi Satur, you're not talking about the world. You're talking about God. There's no, there's no world in Panimi Satur. You're not, we're not sitting here t- and discussing the minutiae of whether you can take this Meister or, or, or if that's considered real tzedakah or if the cow is this or the cow is that and the milk is this and the milk is that. We're talking about elokus. We're talking about souls. We're talking about spheros. We're talking about tzimtzum and or. So there's those are things that have nothing to do with the world, whatsoever. And therefore, the world is just bottled to them automatically. The world is is not. It, that, we'll get, we'll get to that further in a second. But the idea is that since you're not talking about the world, then the refinement takes place in a way where you're not entering into the land of the enemy. You're not even dealing with them. So therefore, all the sparks come to you, as we'll see why in, in this and coming Gemara, paragraph. Gemara would be considered what? Gemara is Moshe in the desert. It's a, it's, a, it's a birur automatically. You don't have to go eat something in order to refine it. You just talk about it. But you're talking about Gashmias. Right? So you're in the land of the enemy. Right. It's considered tefillah. No, to fi- I mean maybe like, maybe in some category. I'm not I'm not saying no like outright, but in this conversation I'm saying no outright because tefillah is the first step when you're actually That's eating more, something, right. right? You're not even you're not. There's nothing automatic when it comes to tefillah, right? It's all hand to hand combat, and anything you're gonna win, you're gonna win because you literally stripped it from your nefesh Bahamas. Whereas in Torah, you're not even dealing with your nefesh Bahamas directly. You're just you're just learning. You're not fighting, but you're learning about things that you would theoretically fight about. You're learning about Gashmis. Is it clear what I'm saying? Because I'm getting a few yeah. indications that it's not totally clear. You following? Yeah? Okay. You with me on this yeah. one? Yeah? Okay, so it's davening, nigla, chasidis. Which is basically eating, and, you know, it's like dealing with the world. Then you have Moshe and Shlomo. <coughs> the two levels of Torah birur are Moshe, Galia the Torah, the revealed parts of Torah, which is not the true Manucha, but it's also a little bit Derech uh, Mamela. And you have Shlomo, which is pure Manucha. Okay, Tess. V'yesh Lomar. We can now say, Shachiluk ben Kuma Hashem, Sha'amar Moshe, L'Kuma Hashem, Sha'amar David. The difference between the rise, O Hashem, that Moshe said when he said, scatter your enemies, and the one that David said, when he said, secha, to your rise, to your peace, to your tranquility, who in yani. The difference between them is really in twofold. But ofen habirur, and this is going to be a little, this little bracket is a review of everything we just said. It's in the manner of the refinement, i.e., shabir aron de mishkan, milchama. That the refinement of the kuma Hashem of Moshe, which is the refinement of the, of the traveling of the aron, was in a way of war. That's why it says, Kuma Hashem, What does it mean, Kuma Hashem? And scatter your enemies, misanecha, and make your, your hated ones flee. Where's the Oivecha and the Misanecha? It's because when you're at war, you have enemies and hated ones. So in Moshe's Kuma Hashem, he, he articulates the enemy right out, outright. 
because there are, because in Moshe's model there are enemies. He's still doing. Uh, he's still in war. And you have to fight with them. Okay, he fought with them in a way of memela, but he still had to fight with an enemy. Whereas in the Biro, Shibi Me Shlomo, in the refinement that took place in Shlomo, Melat's days will be frat, Aide Gilu de Besa Mikdash, particularly when Shlomo manifested out of himself, as we said yesterday, the Besa Mikdash, Haya Baderak Manucha. There was no war to be fought whatsoever, and therefore the Kuma Hashem, rise up and do some Biro, was Lemanucha Secha. It was rise up to your peace because he didn't mention enemies that have to flee and enemies that have to scatter. Kanal Baruch. And that's, that's what we already said. Right? But he says that, uh, he says also, that's the ofen of the Biru. You know, as we described the manner of the Biru, one was in a manner of war, one was in a manner of peace. But he said it's twofold, the difference between them. And the second one is Gamba Biru Atzma, is that the actual refinement itself, not only the way they refine, but the process of the refinement takes place on a different scale. In other words, the work they were doing was not the same work. Not just the way they were doing it was different, but what they were accomplishing was completely different. And that's what we're going to say now. This that the rise, O Hashem, Sha'amar Moshe, that Moshe said, it says, Vayafutsu and Vayanusu. Right, before we, we were, if you see the italic, italicized words, four lines up, he italicizes oivecha and mesanecha. Right. He italicizes, italicizes the enemy, the words for enemy. Because he's trying to say that it was a warfare that was going on. There's an enemy there. But suddenly now, he's italicizing the words vayafutsu and vayanusu. What's he getting at? Is that there's a situation where there's a fleeing and an escaping going on with this enemy. And who gam It's because even after Moshe does his job, goes to the desert and takes care of business, by traveling with the Aaron in the desert, nishar adayin menagdim. Guess what? The bad guy doesn't really go away. Do not leave the building. Just what? They've they've gone and hidden under rocks. They're in a manner of having fled. They're in a manner of having run away. But he doesn't destroy them. Still there. They're still there. So Moshe's birur, not only is it different in its manner, that it's a way of war, but in its effect it's also completely different. He does not eliminate the enemy. No transformation. Exactly. Right? No elimination. It's just really three levels. There's there's, uh, elimination. And there's... I don't even remember what I was talking about. (laughs) There's transformation. (laughs) Right, but there's also not, oh, and there's not even elimination. Right, they just stay there. So there's there's just there's fleeing. Right now, I got myself together. There's fleeing, but the thing stays in place. It's just hiding under a rock. There's elimination, and then higher yet, there's transformation. So Moshe's on stage one. He just scares the enemy out of their pants and it makes room for the king to come through. But they're just waiting to come out again. They're hiding under the rocks. Oh, right there. Is there any sparks from them that get it? Or? That's a great question. Um, there is clearly because uh, you know there there's 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 clearly sparks that get extracted and the because you, what's that? And the yeah, because the very fact that they're fleeing, right, means the tokif of their of their arrogance and their and their their feeling that they own this place has gone away. So that was a chayes that was inside of them, which is no longer inside of them. Right? Now you didn't take away their metzias. So you could call this, let's say, bitul hayesh, not bitul metzias. Right? Like their yeshis has been subdued, but not their very selves. Right? So when you have bitul hayesh, you certainly are yanking kochos from your nefesh of Bahamas and making his power your power. That's called a refinement process. That's simply elevating sparks, but not at the highest level. Right? There's still sparks, in other words, left unrefined. Va'inyin hu... Okay, so now he's going for it here. He says the idea is that when we start to refine from a way of above to below, what does that mean? That the Elyon, that the higher one who's called the refiner, he does not invest himself into the lower one. And therefore, 
The way he gets refined, the lower one, is just by shining light on him. Right? He doesn't climb into him to refine him. He just emits light, and that's how he refines it. That's called milamai lamata. Right? And that would be Shlomo, for example. He didn't leave his place. He didn't climb in. He just shone a, a whole lot of light. Shined. I don't know. Zesha tachton eino menaged. So this that the tachton does not, the lower level, does not oppose, is no longer an enemy. Hu lo mitzad ha-metzias ratzon seichel chul shalom. So it's it, the fact that suddenly when you shine light at him from above to below, like a Shlomo model, the fact that he's no longer an enemy, right, it's not because of his own metzias, the, the tachton. It's not because the enemy, with his will, with his seichel, right, he's determined that he's not going to be an enemy anymore. El adraba, but on the contrary, or it's because you shine so much light on him, which is completely incomparable to him, whom is batob metziyuso. He simply gets nullified. In other words, a person could come in, let's say, like some kind of a heretic or a, you know, some, some ill-informed person, and he's going to say, I'm going to teach the Rebbe a thing or two. I'm going to tell him what's really going on. And he's an enemy, right? And he comes to the Rebbe in order to fight, and when he starts hearing the Rebbe say one sicha, he just can't even find his, his feet and his hands anymore. He doesn't, he's, he's, he completely, it's not because he changed his mind. It's not because he became a friend. It's because he was just nullified out of existence. He realized that I'm dealing with something way beyond my, my pay grade over here, and I got nothing else to say, right? And so this is, this is the idea of shining so much. This is what it means to shine so much light. You just push it, nullify the existence of a person. That, it's another advantage of being a big Talmud Chacham. You don't have to do as much work. I mean, you have to do the work inside the room, but not outside the room. In other words, when, when you come across people that are Talmud Chachamim, they just dominate the situation without doing a whole lot because the, the second they open their mouth, people are like courteous and obedient. They're like, oh, yes, Rabbi, what can I do for you? Because they're... They've, they've created a tremendous amount of light that comes out of them. Yeah, but then it's not really like them at the end of the day. Like, they're, whatever their they're bottle is from, the, it's from just too much oil. So what, I like, love it. What you're saying is very true and astute, but that's already something beyond Shlomo HaMelech. You're, 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 you're Mama Chassid, seeing the, the flaw in Shlomo HaMelech. <laughs> right? But it's true. You're 100% right, but we'll get to that. Right. But meanwhile, it's pretty great that without even fighting with anybody, you just open your mouth and shed light all your enemies are no longer in the picture. They just disappear. They come to you and they bring you gold and silver from Sheba. <laughs> when the refinement comes, the opposite way, when the Elyon, the higher one, has to come into the place of the Tachton, in other words, you have to enter into discussion with this young man, right? In other words, it's not the Rebbe that he comes to see. It's, it's Rabbi Pasternak. So all of a sudden, I can't just start saying a sikha and he's going to say, oh, I forget it, I don't have any questions anymore. We're going to have to start talking about it, right? And arguing. So you have to go into his seichel and you go into his intellect and you have to start to fight with him. Right? So you have to go into the place of the misbarer, you have to go into the place of the ref- one that needs to be refined. What is this really showing? Is that there's not such a difference in level between the, the two opponents in this battle. Because if I have to come down to the person's level to deal with him, it means he takes up space in my reality. In other words, his position is something I have to consider. I'm not so beyond his position that I just sort of like ignite myself and his position disappears because it's completely irrelevant to the reality. I understand his perspective. And I'm like, somewhat, I have that false perspective inside of me. That's why I have to go deal with it and refine it mano y mano with him. Which means that his perspective, his it takes up place in my mind. It, it has a certain chashivas and importance of reality to it, which I have to deal with. Yeah. This seems more like the Mishkan, though. Going into the, the going yeah, that's into what we're talking about. This is now a, a, a bureau from... This is, this is the bureau of Milchama, we're saying. That's what we're saying. This is the difference of the two. Shlomo stands in his place and nullifies the enemy entirely just by shining so much light. Moshe doesn't stand in his place and nullify the enemy entirely. He has to go into the land of the evil desert which shows you that he's not so distant from their level. Right? He actually has to in some way recognize 
the significance of what they're doing and what they're saying to the point that he has to actually go travel to where they are. He refines them and he nullifies them and makes them run away and scared. He wins the argument. But the fact is he doesn't undo their very existence because their very existence is actually chashif to him. He gets their existence. He's recognizing the significance of their position. So how can you busy nullify their position while, you're, while you yourself recognize that it has place? That's, that's kind of the point of this matter. Well, this you have a more mercy to go down and no. them? It's not, that's not the case here. In other words, maybe you could make such a case. That's kind of where Yosef was going. Something even higher than Shlomo, theoretically. But in this capacity, you, 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 you're forced, if you want to get rid of it, if you want to refine it, you're forced to go deal with it because you are, you know, it's not just simply because of mercy that you're, 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 you're going to sort of give them room. And as the Rebbe maybe will enter into conversation with the guy just because he wants them to feel like he loves him. You know, he's not going to just nullify his existence. But that's not what's going on here. Moses is trying to fight the enemy. He's not trying to do him a favor. The, and the problem is he can't fight them by just shining so much light that they disappear because in his mind, they're a serious concern for him. Right? Because they, they take up place. It's really the incomplete side from the food side. Mm-hmm. To, the, uh, to the ra inside in some capacity and someone, and what is it, know what's going on. yeah and, uh, it's exactly what we're dealing with but you're you are changing him how are you changing him By you're that? making him run away no let's just get uh, let me just, it was, sorry it was a rhetorical question you're changing him because he runs under the rock but you did not as 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 Reb Mordech, uh, Ephraim said you did not Transform him. You didn't really change him in this model. Just by dealing with him, you didn't really change him. What you did was you convinced him to come to yeshiva. Yeah, you won the argument. But his snakes and scorpions did not go away. Right? He just, they just, they're just under a rock. He'll put them on hold. He'll have what we call, uh, you know, he'll, I forget what's the word. He'll, uh, he'll, he'll suspend his disbelief. That's what it is. He'll suspend his disbelief. He didn't. Dis, he, he, he still believes in the wrong things, but he's suspending it. Right? He's made them run under the rocks and scorpions. Ultimately, that's a good start. If the snakes and scorpions are not fighting him and biting him, he can have a little bit of a breathing room and start to check out Kedusha. But, but the idea is that you didn't destroy the enemy. So this is not the type of Hislav Shush that Yosef, that you're now for the second time aiming for, that your mom has transformed the guy. That's not what's going on. When you learn nikla, it's not going on. When you, when you, uh, when you transform by way of milchama in this capacity. Does Shlomo actually transform? Shlomo transform? also didn't transform. Shlomo like, nullified. No, it, it, he nullified them. He made it so that they don't exist. Remember, we said there's three levels. There's there's make there's making them run away, but you don't you don't you don't make them uh, disappear. There's there's eliminating them, and that's what he did. He eliminated them. He brought so much light that he was, he was in such a place that their perspective was, was non-existent. That's the point. Their perspective was non-existent because in his mind, it didn't exist. He, he, he couldn't even see them. It's like what we're dealing with here. Remember, what does Shlomo represent? He's going to put all the pieces together for us, but I'm schlepping us out. He represents Atik. Atik is a level of godliness that does not recognize the world. So when Shlomo is bringing Atik to the table, which he was, the world has automatically disappeared because there's a level of divinity now in the world where the world doesn't even exist before him. So he eliminated the problem. Moshe brought what? Let's say he gave tzedakah to the world. So he brought, let's say, arich to the world. He brought levels of divinity which were still shaykh to the world. If you're dealing with levels of divinity which recognize, and not only recognize, but are in the process of producing a world, it can't simultaneously undo the world. If this level of godliness is what is required to keep the world in existence, then it cannot. Sim- then when you bring it, you cannot simultaneously undo the world from its existence. That's what I've been trying to say. Yeah. So Moshe was right. No, no, he was rich. He was rich. So Moshe and Shlomo both can't transform. Yes. No perspective that. Yes. Moshe negates, but Shlomo eliminates. But we still we don't we don't know what a chassid really is yet. That's why I was getting a little bit lost. Right. I know it's confusing. There's a lot of things going on here. Right. Yeah, I've been sort of hinting that the whole time. What, what is, what's, 
What's Shlomo like category? Atik. Anyway, he's like Sadaka. No, he's. That's a good question. He's rich. He's rich. Yeah, he's rich. More than Sadaka. He's not. Uh, he's not the ultimate level of Chesed. Remember, Chesed is shy to giving to the rich and the poor. Right. Right. So he's not giving Chesed to the rich. He's giving Chesed to the poor, which means he's giving them more than Sadaka. But he's not, and he's even making them rich. Right. But he's not giving Chesed to the rich. Right. Right. So, let's go on one more line here, because this is the, this point we haven't fully seen inside yet. The idea is that when you, when you refine in a way that the Elion has to enclose himself into the Tachton, the higher one has to go into the place of the enemy. Right? You see where we are? Where are we, Lachim? One, two, three, four. Okay, let's just go up one line. Harizem Ochiach Shatachton. This proves that the lower one is Tofes Makum Lagabe. He holds some kind of a place in his, in his perspective. I, I really want you guys to understand this line. Therefore, it's not Shaykh that by revealing that level of light, of motion in the desert, it's not even Shaykh to nullify him completely and eliminate him. Why? Again, it's because the level of light that he's bringing is a level of light which recognizes the existence of the world. Remember, we're basically saying that there's something called light which is Shaykh to the world and light which is not Shaykh to the world. Light which is shy to the world means a godly light which is responsible for making the world. Hmm. So as much light as I will bring of that breed, I will never be able to undo the existence of the world with it because it itself is busy making and recognizing the, the parameters and the confines of the world. Wow. So as much as I'll bring it in there, it can make a world a great place, but it can never undo the parameters of the world. Hmm. It can make the snakes and scorpions hide and sort of go into a state where they're, they're taking their proper place as the servants of Kedusha, but it can't undo the klippas altogether because part of the world is klippas. Even part of the perfect world is klippas in, in this capacity. Even, even Arich, which is shy to the world, still recognizes a certain level of klippas. Just uh-huh. so take a what? Isn't no, it, of Moshe. Isn't that... Isn't so, that yeah, it's, it's, not, then, it's not so clear. Isn't that the side of a complete tzaddik where you recognize the world exists, but you're not destroying the world? It's kind of like, uh, like incomplete tzaddik would be like Shmuel Bar Yochai coming out of the cave for the first time. He saw Jews working in the field, and the mom was burnt up because he's, I don't know. Yeah, that's did it. Um, you're kind of going back to where Yosef was going, right? Which is that there's yet a higher level, right? Even right. from Shlomo. So you want to see the world and the world as perfect. But before we get to such a, a level, we want to undo the world, right? We want to subdue the world, and we want to eliminate the world. That is the, that is the first, and, and only after you can get to such a place where you can eliminate the world, then you can come to that level where there's no opponents whatsoever, then you can sort of reproduce, as it were, a perfect world, which doesn't even have clippers in it. But that's coming later. But I want, I want to try and clarify this point, because I feel like it's not totally clear. Shlomo says Panimus Atera. How can it be that you're still not learning Panimus Atera? How can it be that even through Shlomo that you can't, you can't? Uh, it must be that there's two levels of Panimus Atera. There's Chagas and Chabad, or there's Kabbalah and there's Chassidus. In other words, even there, there's, it's called Nishmasa Deraisa and Nishmasa de Nishmasa Deraisa. Right? There's the soul of the Torah and the soul of the soul of the Torah. Shlomo got pretty high, but there's higher yet. Um, last, uh, listen, we, we kind of ran out of time, but the last, just I want to just clarify this one point because I don't, I don't think it's totally clear, right? What's the difference between Arich and Atik, right? Arich is the lower part of Keser, Atik is the higher part of Keser. Arich is the ten spheros before they come into the world and actually create it uh, in a real manifest way. But there's still the potential world there which recognizes certainly that there is such a thing as ten spheres, there is such a thing but as a uh, world, Arich? that's Arich, the lower part of Kesser. It's, it's like the world in potential, mm-hmm. right? Whereas Atik is beyond the world altogether. World, the whole idea of the world didn't even come into place yet, right? So now, when it comes to trying to r- bring those two lights into the world, where Moshe brought the first one and Shlomo brought the second one, you can see that by bringing Arich into the world, while you can make the world subdued because you're bringing a level of light which is beyond the world but it recognizes the world, Arich, 
You can never really undo entirely the existence of the snakes and scorpions. You can just make them hide because in that realm of Arich, there is such a thing as snakes and scorpions in its dimension. It recognizes the world in its fullness. So therefore, Moshe could not undo the clippers entirely. Whereas Shlomo with Atik, he's in a place where there's no world whatsoever. So if you're going to be a kli a, a for that light into the world, he actually can eliminate anything having to do with op- opposition to Elokus because he's bringing a, sta- a status of light which doesn't l'chathchila recognize the existence of the world. So therefore, what happens to a klippa when you bring before it a light which doesn't recognize its existence at all? It disappears. It becomes like, like we said before, it can't find its, its feet in its hands. It's just like its, its arguments just go away. It becomes completely, disappears. Okay. So that's why that the biru that happens to Shlomo, not only was it in a different way, it was in a way of peace where Moses was in a way of war, but it accomplished something completely different. Because it was coming from such a high place, it had the power to undo the clippers out of their very existence. Whereas Moshe, because he was in a way of war, and therefore had to deal with the existence of the enemy, you can't simultaneously recognize his existence and undo his existence at the same time. And therefore, he could only subdue his existence, but not do away with his existence. And therefore, even the, the actual bearer was a completely different level. That's basically the lesson of the class. That kind of sounds very similar to the Yitzchak and the Okay. Yeah. R- 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 can you hold on there. Okay. R- r- you said you said, you said that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what you mean. Yeah. Remember last time we were talking about Yitzchak, like not really seeing the world as the world.